Okay. Well, if I had realized that I was going to be taped, I would have prepared. Um, you know, I'm not just joking. It's not terribly well prepared. Uh, as far as writing letters, Yenchen, I just wrote a letter from my first student, who is now 70 years old. Uh, so uh, I probably have a long way to go with you. So, so be careful. OK, this is up. OK, so this, this is a small subject, actually, but it ha has an interesting, uh, it has an interesting piece of well, physics or engineering, uh, however you want to look at it. And, and it concerns the behavior of objects, um, small objects, which are made up of elements which are much smaller than they are, and how they respond uh, to mechanical stress. And, and uh, in particular, I'm going to try to explain why the tidal evolution of these small bodies, uh, and these bodies are mainly near-Earth near uh, asteroid binaries, binary near-Earth asteroids, why the tidal evolution is at least 10,000 times faster than uh, would be true for bodies of the same composition that were monoliths, that were uh, sort of single coherent objects. So that's, that's the general picture. And, and I hope everybody gets at least a general idea of this. Um, and uh, maybe you'll get a little bit more detail, too. So this work I did with Ray M. Sorry. This is uh, how we know, well, one of the ways we know about near-Earth asteroids. Uh, this is, um, these are radar images made uh, by a group at JPL, uh, led by Steve Ostro. His name is up, up here. These are recent. And, and, and the way these, these work is you, you shine a, a radar on these asteroids, and you receive the return signal. Radar is essentially monochromatic. You, return the, you, you, you receive the uh, return signal, or the scattered signal, and, and you have certain markers uh, in, in the outgoing signal, time, time markers. When you receive the return signal, it's, of course, Doppler shifted. The monochromatic signal is spread by motion of the uh, different parts of the asteroid relative to us. So you get differential Doppler shifts from different parts of the a asteroid. And you also get time delays because different parts of the asteroid are different distances from you. And from these Doppler delays, you can build up a picture both of the motion of the asteroid, of its rotation, for example, or if it's librating, uh, and also of the geometrical shape. Now you can also learn other things because in general these signals are sent circularly polarized and the circularly polarized signal that's reflected from a smooth surface comes back with the opposite sense of polarization. But if it's scattered more than once, then some of the return power can have the same sense of polarization. And so you can learn about how much multiple scattering there is. And this is a way of learning something about surfness, roughness. So these images are of a binary uh, Earth asteroid. And along this dimension is the time delay, which has been translated into kilometers. And along the other direction is the Doppler shift, uh, which tells you about how these different places are, are rotating. And, and by doing these observations and looking at the asteroid from different viewing angles, as it, as it moves around relative to the Earth, you can build up a three-dimensional and accurate three-dimensional picture of the asteroid and its, its motion. Uh, in this case, the, this, this is a near-Earth asteroid. It had a companion, so you see uh, off here the reflection from the companion. You see it's at different places in different images. Uh, this has all been done with uh, uh, Arecibo. Arecibo isn't steerable, so you only get rather short exposures uh, but it's a very big telescope. And here you have a steerable telescope, a uh, Goldstone uh, telescope. And you get less good signal to noise, but you can uh, follow the, uh, the motion uh, more closely. And so this is the sort of data, the, the best sort of data that, that we have. And from this we get 
geometrical shapes of these asteroids. We get something about surface roughness. We get a lot of detail about the rotation, quite accurate detail about the rotation, even a certain amount of irregularity in the rotation and changes in the rotation rate. And all of this will play some role uh, in this lecture. So here I brought um, a few models of uh, near-Earth asteroids so you can get a feeling for what they look like. Typically we're talking about objects where the, when I'm talking about binaries in which the primary may be a kilometer or two in diameter and the secondary might be a few tenths of a kilometer. So these are not big, uh, big objects. And that, because of that, there are other interesting effects that they suffer due to radiation pressure. Uh, and I'll talk about those uh, in a little while. No, no, these are OK. These are OK. They, I, I borrowed them from some uh, colleague of mine. So. Uh, these are not rubble piles. Uh, but we know that in many cases, these small objects are rubble piles because their densities can be measured from their volumes and the orbital motion of their companions. And their densities are much lower than the densities of rocks, typically sort of half what we would expect for the density of uh, solid rocks. So the density would be 1.7, where we expect the rock to be 3.4. And we also know that there are bigger rubble piles in the solar system, and I'll, I'll talk about those a bit as well. And in particular, I'll try to explain what the upper limit to the size of a rubble pile is. Um, we, we, we know that there are icy objects, uh, satellites of Saturn, uh, which have diam well, which have radii up to about 100 kilometers, which is substantially under dense, which have densities like 0.6 grams per cc. And they're objects just a little bit smaller, maybe 70 uh, kilometer radius with well-determined uh, masses in which the densities are 0.5 or even 0.4. Uh, grams per cc. And then among the main belt asteroids, there are other objects also, these are rocky objects, which are up to about 100 kilometers in radius, whose densities are sort of typically two-thirds or maybe even a little bit less than the, uh, than the density of, of rock. So rubber piles certainly present in the solar system. Uh, we don't understand the very long-term behavior of solids that are pressed together against each other gently uh, very well. But we're pretty sure from these observations, at least, that if they're not pressed too hard and they're not very hot, they can stay as loose aggregates with a lot of void space, uh, basically for the age of the solar system. OK. So this is uh, an example of the sort of things you can learn from this type of data. You can make models of the shapes of the individual objects. You get the rotations at different phases uh, and so on. You can make three-dimensional models for these viewed from different axes. Um, uh, the radar is actually the best uh, data we have, better than it currently, at least, optical uh, data. OK, now. We're not really sure how these uh, form. Uh, I'll talk now here about the near-Earth asteroids. About 15% of near-Earth asteroids are binaries. This is a much higher percent than the fraction of binaries among main belt asteroids. And it's thought that the formation of these binaries occurs by two processes. Uh, which are different from those that, that affect the bigger, more distant uh, main belt asteroids. Uh, the first one, which is probably not the dominant one, is tidal disruption. Uh, these these uh, bodies make close encounters, since they're near Earth asteroids, they make close encounters with the Earth and also, uh, in many cases, with Venus and Mars. And they can be broken tidally especially if they were already rubble piles. And this then gives a chance for binary formation. And here from uh, Walsh and Richardson, a paper by Walsh and Richardson. Richardson, Derek Richardson, was a uh, CETA 
a member uh, on one of the times I spent considerable time here, maybe uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, I don't know, a while back. Anyway, and uh, Walsh, I guess, is a student. This shows a rubble pile that made on a computer going through a tidal uh, encounter being torn apart and producing a binary. An important feature of this is the production of a binary in this way leads to a very eccentric orbit. Uh, yet when we observe near-Earth asteroids, binaries, they're essentially all in circular or nearly circular orbits, an indication that tides uh, have uh, been working. Okay, and this is the other, and I think probably more plausible explanation for how these binaries form. And this is called the Yorp effect. What we have here is the rotation rate as a function of time uh, as measured uh, uh, by Taylor et al. Uh, over, you see a period here of five years of a near-Earth uh, asteroid. And you see this near-Earth near asteroid's rotation period is speeding up. And it's speeding up by a few parts in a million. So uh, in a million years, it's going to be rotating significantly faster than it is now. And, uh, and it's pretty clear uh, that this speed up, which is due to the asymmetrical absorption of radiation and then re-emission of radiation, uh, so absorption of solar radiation, re-emission, is infrared. Uh, can, it can cause both speed up and spin down. We also have examples of uh, uh, spinning down near-Earth asteroids. And for small bodies, bodies of order a kilometer, in time scales of order a million years, this can lead them to spin so fast that they disrupt just from rotational uh, disruption. And again, we see examples of very rapidly rotating near-Earth asteroids. And the plausible explanation is that they've been spun up by this Yorp effect. It's an easy thing to work out. I, I, I won't uh, bother you with it. But if you work out the momentum of the sunlight, it's intercepted and then uh, by, by uh, well, just the energy that's intercepted. And then you work out the momentum of the photons that go off. They go off sufficiently uh, uh, asymmetrically. You'll see that you can get a very rapid spin up of this order with just about a 1% asymmetry for one kilometer object uh, uh, um, just from absorbed sunlight or reflected sunlight. It doesn't matter really whether it's absorbed or, or reflected. OK, so these are the two uh, formation mechanisms. This also leads to eccentric orbits. And again, the fact that these orbits are seen to be circular suggests that tidal interaction works very rapidly in these systems. OK, whoops. So now let me explain a little bit how this tidal evolution occurs. I'm not going to do this in any detail, but just give you the general idea. So now we want to talk about tidal evolution, not during an encounter of a single near-Earth asteroid with a planet, but tidal interaction in a binary system, already formed binary system. Now. If you had a non-rotating body, or if you had a synchronously, let's say, rotating primary, so the primary rotated the same rate as, uh, as the uh, orbit of the mutual orbit of the primary and secondary, about the center of mass, then the tidal distortion would look like this. So if we had a spherical primary subject to a tide, and there was synchronous rotation, you would get a tidal distribution that, or distortion of the primary that looking from above the orbit looked like this. And there would be no torque associated with that just because of symmetry. Uh, if, the, uh, if the primary is spinning faster than the secondary is orbiting it, and there's no dissipation in the primary, there were no dissipation in the primary, then the tidal distortion of the primary would still look like this. In other words, the tides would be perfectly aligned with the direction to the secondary. 
But if the primary is spinning faster than the secondary is orbiting, and there's dissipation associated with the stretching, the tidal stretching of the primary, then the time of high tide on the primary is delayed. And in the time it takes the high tide to come up, the tidal bulge rotates ahead in the sense of the orbit, rotates ahead of the secondary. And then this gives a tidal torque. Now because this bulge depends upon the cube, it's a tidal bulge, depends on the cube of the separation, inverse cube of the separation. And because it's a quadrupole potential going back, because the torque is the derivative of the potential with respect to angle, the tidal torque is a 1 over 6th power dependence on separation. And it also depends, this angle also depends upon the fractional dissipation of the energy of stretching, the tidal energy of stretching uh, uh, per cycle. Now typically for solid bodies, solid ices, solid uh, rocks, we know both from laboratory experiments and also from evolution of bodies in the solar system that the dissipation of uh, uh, strain energy uh, per cycle is about 1%. We say the tidal Q is about 100, so this is a very small angle. It's about half a, would be, uh, about half a degree or so. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about how big the bulge is and how big this angle is, because that determines the, the tidal rates. Now, from the lifetimes of computed now, not known, but computed lifetimes of binary near-Earth asteroids, because binary, two things happen to near-Earth asteroids. They, they get ejected from their current orbits by planetary perturbations, and typically they last 10 million years or so. Most of them end up going into the sun. A few of them impact the terrestrial planets, and a few are thrown out of the solar system because they get too close to Jupiter. Uh, so the typical near-Earth asteroid has a lifetime of about 10 million years. The um, binaries are more fragile to tides, and so they have typical lifetimes of about a million years. And so the time scale over which newly formed near-Earth asteroid binaries must circular, circularize must be something like about a million years. And from this time scale, their dimensions and the known properties of tides in monolithic bodies, bodies that are not rubble piles, we know that the tidal evolution is at least 10,000 times faster in these systems than it would be if these were just coherent monolithic bodies. And, and this has two consequences. One is it tells us that the secondaries, which is where the tidal energy of eccentricity, which I'll explain later, is being dissipated, have to be uh, soft. They have to stretch easily. There'll be tides in this object as well. They have to be soft. And probably also that the uh, tidal dissipation per flexure cycle has to be greater uh, than in a monolithic body. Oops. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'll, I'll come back to this. Well, I can show you now. Okay, so there, there are two types of tides. There are tides raised on the primary body, tides raised on the secondary. The secondary bodies in these systems are always synchronously spinning. That is there always like the moon, keeping the same face towards the primary. This is a tidal despinning effect. Happens very, very quickly. In a few cases where we have really good radar uh, information, we know that the secondaries are spinning uh, uh, synchronously. The primaries, in general, are spinning more rapidly than synchronously. They have most of the angular momentum in the system. The secondaries are moving away from the primary because of these tidal torques. And the eccentricity is changing, and it's changing both due to tides that are raised by the secondary on the primary and tides that are raised by the, by the primary on the secondary. And the first type of tide, the tide that the 
secondary raises on the primary, that causes the orbital eccentricity to increase. And, and the reason for that is that the tidal torque that's exerted on the, on the orbit of the secondary, because the tidal bulge is in advance here, this tidal torque has a very steep dependence, one over all six dependence on distance. So the tidal torque is strongest by far at closest approach of the secondary to the primary. So the secondary gets a kick in its orbit, pushing it forward when it's a, a pericenter. And that doesn't change the pericenter because two body orbits are periodic, but it raises the apocenter. And then, uh, so as the orbit of the secondary goes out, the effects of tides it raises in the primary is to increase its orbital eccentricity. The tides raised on the secondary, on the other hand, just cause the second, they, they, they're pointed right towards the primary, they just cause the secondary to expand and contract along the direction to the primary. They don't transfer any angular momentum, they just cause energy dissipation, and therefore they cause the eccentricity of the secondary, of the orbit, to decay. And, and you see that there are two parameters, well, everything in these two equations is known except for two parameters. We know the masses of the primary and secondary in general. We know their orbital, we know the sizes. These are just the radii of the primary and secondary. We know the distance or the semi-major axis of the orbit. So all this is known. And, the two, and, and this is the mean orbital angular velocity, two pi over the period. That's also known. The two things that aren't known are this k and q. Q I've already referred to, it's the quality factor. Big Q means big quality, little dissipation. So it comes in the denominator here. The higher the quality factor, the slower the evolution. The smaller the angle, these lag angles are. The other parameter, which I'm going to spend more time on, is this K. For monolithic bodies like the Earth or the Moon, big bodies, we always can compute K from knowing roughly what the material of the body is. We can compute it to a factor of 30%, 50% at worst. It's not generally the, the thing that limits our knowledge. It's more Q. But in this case, you'll see it's more K. K is uncertain to very large factor. What K, this, K is called the love number. Uh, not over the act, but over the, after the name of an elastician who wrote a book on mathematical elasticity and worked out the values of K for elastic self-gravitating bodies. And basically, the response, the tidal response, the ease of stretching a body, that comes into this, this K. Uh, and, and there are two things that resist tidal stretching of a body. One is self-gravity of the body, and that applies to big bodies, particularly to fluid bodies, like the giant planets. And the other is the elastic strength of the body. That applies, dominates for small bodies. The Earth is a marginal in-between case. For the Earth, self-gravity and elasticity are comparable. The Earth is about as stiff as steel. Well, it's as stiff as, as, as good silicate rock. Um, and, um, and, and these uh, two effects are the same. This mu is the ratio of the effect due to elasticity, of the strength due to elasticity and, and due to self-gravity. For the Earth, it's a void of unity. But for small bodies, this mu is very, very large. The elasticity effects are much larger than the self-gravity effects. And this mu is extremely large. K is very, very small. And that weakens the effects of tides. And so what I'm going to mainly try to convince you of is that these Ks for rubble piles are very, very much bigger by orders of magnitude for small rubble piles than you would expect if these were monolithic bodies. That's this factor of 10,000. OK, we'll come back to this. So now I want to just talk about the rigidity of bodies, how, how rigid uh, bodies are. So here I'm asking, what happens if I have a force 
a stretching force that I apply to a body of, of mass, uh, well, with self-gravity g, mean density rho, and radius r. Uh, how much does this stretch? And how does that stretching compare with the radius of the body? What is the strain? And I'm going to do this only for a, a weak force, so the strain is always going to be uh, considered to be small. And, and you can see from this uh, top part here that if I raise a tidal bump or a tidal bulge, which has a mass in it of order delta m, against the surface gravity on the body, little g, uh, uh, then that'll just balance F, the weight of it will just balance F. And what is little delta M? It's just the density times the surface area times a height that I raise the tidal bulge. So this tells us, tells us for a fluid body, self-gravitating fluid body, what the size of the tidal bulge is for a given tidal force. And the strain, which is just delta X over R, is just little f, over G rho R cubed. So that's the tidal strain for a fluid body, something like Jupiter, so on. Now what if the body is very small and is elastic and we can forget about self-gravity? Then the force needed to stretch it, to give it a strain, epsilon, now an elastic strain, is just the elastic modulus, which I'll call mu here. For an incompressible body, this would be just the rigidity but it's just one of the elastic moduli times the radius squared times the cross-sectional area. And so the elastic strain is just this F divided by mu r squared. And then in this subject, it's customary to, de to define a dimensionless rigidity, which is the ratio of the strain that the fluid body would suffer to the ratio that the elastic body would uh, suffer, and that's just mu over g rho r. So this is essentially mu over the pressure at the center of the body. Actually, if you do this very accurately, the quantity that comes in here has a 2 over 19. But uh, for this purpose, that's what Love did, uh, the 2 over 19. Well, he did it. 2 over 19 is for a quadrupole potential. There are different numbers for higher multiples. So this is a, a rigidity divided by a pressure which is dimensionless. Okay, what is a typical rigidity for a rock? Well, typical rigidity for a rock, rigidity is, uh, you can think of as being related to the binding energy of the molecules in a rock. And so you sort of get an EV uh, binding energy for a uh, few cubic angstroms. And if you work that out, that's a fraction of a megabar, if you want to think of that in terms of a pressure. Uh, or in CGS units, maybe for a rock, three to five times uh, 10 to the 11 dynes per square centimeter. That's a typical rigidity. The pressure in the Earth is, center of the Earth is a what are 10 times higher than that. So the rocks are really squeezed in the center of the Earth. The center of the moon, the density is actually a little lower than on, in the moon on average because the pressure isn't high enough to cause a lot of squeezing and the temperature is a little higher than on the surface and so there's thermal expansion. So the moon's actually lower density in the middle than on the outside. Okay, so we're gonna come back to this quantity now. Okay, so now I want to talk about what's known as the Hertz model. This is the famous Hertz of electricity and magnetism from two centuries ago now. And uh, Hertz studied this problem of what happens if you have elastic bodies in contact uh, with each other. And so here's, here's the picture. We have a ball here. So I'm going to try to illustrate it with this ball there. We have a ball. We press down on it with a force F. And we're interested in what happens where the ball contacts, uh, let's say, in this case, a uh, uh, rigid table. Well, one thing you can be sure of is that the pressure on the table where the contact occurs, it's going to be spread out over some area. 
the pressure on the, con on the table where the contact occurs is going to be higher than F divided by pi r squared of the ball because the contact area is going to be small compared to the cross-sectional area of the ball. So if I uh, press down on this ball, you see it flattens out at the bottom. This is a pretty poorly blown up ball. <laughs> in fact, it's, uh, I'm not doing it any good by pressing on it. I brought another one here. You see, you press on it, it flattens out. Okay. So, so the pressure at the contact or the stress at the contact points if you have an object, a big object made up of a lot of these balls, is going to be higher than it would be if the object was made up of cubes, which just fit neatly together, because the contact points uh, will be smaller than the typical dimensions of the ball. And so when you take that into account, you have this force. It's, oh, we call delta x the amount by which you flatten the ball. And then that gives, just from the geometry of a circle, a flattened chord here, which is of order the square root of r times delta x. And the maximum, or the sort of peak strain, is in a region about like this, with a dimension of order r, uh, square root of r times delta x. And so if we take that all into account, we can balance the force uh, that we've applied to the ball, to the stress it's, it exerts on the, on the contact surface, we can put in for, uh, in here, uh, the appropriate expression for the strain. The strain is just uh, the square root of delta x over r, or it's yeah, it's the square root of delta x divided by the radius of the ball. And we get this expression. And then we can relate delta x here and f. And we get an effective, an effective uh, stiffness of this ball by measuring how far we can compress it, the amount delta x we can compress it with... Uh, with uh, a force F, and we find that the effective rigidity of this ball is mu times delta X over R to the one half. This is in general, if you're not pushing too hard, a very small number, take the square root of it. Or if we relate delta X and R, which we can do from here, this is mu times the third root of P, the pressure this is the overpressure. So the pressure here is F divided by pi r squared. It's the pressure divided by mu. So if the pressure is rather low compared to mu, so remember, mu is almost a megabar in pressure. So if the pressure is, in an atmos is one atmosphere, and this is a million atmospheres, we take the one-third power here. We get about a factor of one over 100. So the effective rigidity against being pushed down this way of this ball, if we put on a pressure of order one atmosphere and its rigidity was really that of rock, the effective rigidity would be the actual rigidity reduced by a factor of, of 100, the cube root of one over a million. Okay, so is that clear? So if I, if I had a ball here of rock and I push down on it, with 10 to the 6 dynes, uh, with the equivalent of 10 to the 6 dynes per square centimeter in, times the cross-sectional area of the ball, then it would compress a little bit. And the amount by which it would go down would be, that it would be pressed down, would be larger by a factor of 100 than if I had a cube the size of this ball in the form of a rock and I pressed down on it with the same pressure. So it's a factor of a million, I mean a factor of, uh, of 100, okay? Something, uh, something like this, with, with a pressure of one atmosphere. Now we're gonna be talking about objects whose internal pressure is actually less than an atmosphere, and we're gonna show that this uh, one third really is more like one half. And so when you take the uh, 
the square root of that, instead of getting a factor of 1 over 100, you get a factor of more like 1 over uh, 1,000, or for smaller bodies, 1 over 10,000. So that's the general idea. I'm going to kill myself with this. You should have good insurance if you're going to give all your, uh, especially if they're from America. OK, so now I want to talk about rubble pile models and um, of, of, of varying sophistication. So the first one I haven't talked about yet, but imagine we have a, a big object like this. This is our asteroid, and we just slice it up into cubes. What is its effective rigidity on the tidal perturbations? Uh, well, this is the first thing I, I worried about when I started to think about this problem. And, and it's not difficult to convince yourself that the tidal rigidity isn't affected at all, or the effective rigidity isn't affected at all by breaking the body up into cubes. Because if you apply a weak perturbation, a weak stress to a self-gravitating body, weak in, in, in comparison to the self-gravity, and the body's divided up into cubes, you're not going to get any slipping because the cubes are all resting on the top of each other, and static friction will keep them from slipping. And the coefficient of static friction of just about anything except wet ice is very near unity. So if your stress is small compared to the, to the pressure uh, needed to support the object against its self-gravity, slicing it doesn't make any difference to its tidal response. So it isn't the slicing that's critical to the tidal response. It's the voids. It's the voids that matter. And the voids matter because the contact points then become uh, uh, much smaller uh, than in the case of, of the cubes or for, for a monolithic body. The stresses become concentrated. So if we imagine making a body out of spheres like this, little spheres, then the effective, uh, um, well, this is now, I'm, I'm now working in terms of this dimensionless rigidity, the rigidity divided by the pressure, the sort of typical pressure in the body. If we, if we make something like this out of spheres, the effective rigidity, dimensionless effective rigidity, becomes the effective rigidity of a monolithic body of the same material to the two-thirds power. So if this is a very big number, this mu to, of, of, a, of a body of that size, this mu tilde for a body of that size, if it's monolithic, when we take the two-thirds power, it's a smaller number. So this is where that first factor of 100 comes from. If mu is a million, and the body that's 1,000 times smaller than the Earth, so the Earth is 10,000. If the Earth were as dense as uncompressed rock, it would be about 10,000 kilometers in, in radius. So if, if you go down from 10,000 kilometers to one kilometer, you go down a factor of, oh, excuse me, from 10,000 kilometers to 10 kilometers, you go down a factor of 1,000 in radius, you go down a factor of a million in central pressure. And as far as rigidity is concerned, if that body of 10 kilometer radius is a rubble pile, its effective rigidity is reduced uh, um, by this, uh, oh, I should say also, it's, 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 it's central pressure now is a little bit more than an atmosphere, and its rigidity is reduced uh, by almost 100. It doesn't matter whether the, how big, yeah, the elements, that's right, that's a very good point. The size of the elements, the size of these spheres you divide the body in, drops out. It's irrelevant, independent of that. That's right, that's a crucial point here. That's why you can do something in this subject. You don't really have to know how big the, and this was actually worked out by Hertz. It was worked out by Hertz uh, for bodies that were smooth, had no uh, friction. Uh, and then uh, later, many years later, uh, another person named Mindlin uh, worked it out for, uh, for, for uh, spheres again, but where he allowed friction forces. And uh, 
I just looked at the paper. I didn't uh, read it because it's much more complicated. Okay, so, so the question is now, what happens if instead of spheres, because we don't expect rubble piles to be spheres, we have just some random uh, uh, small shapes. And, and that's basically the rest of this. Uh, so if we have irregular elements like this, in which the radius of curvature at the, in, at the contact point, instead of being the size of the body, is this r hat, which we assume to be much smaller than the size of the body. Then, just by sort of generalizing what I've already been talking about, you can see that this is going to make the body more compressible. It's going to make its effective rigidity smaller, because with a smaller radius of curvature, you're going to get more concentration of stress, uh, more change in, in, in size uh, when you, when you uh, stress it. And it turns out, in this case, that the effective rigidity, dimensionless again, goes like the two-thirds power here, but then there's this ratio of the size of the contact point, of the radius of curvature of the contact point, to the radius of the body, to the one-third power. Now, you might ask, how small can these points be? Well, there's a limit, because if you make these points too sharp, then you concentrate the stress too much, and the, the overburden is going to break the point. So if you have a pencil, and here you have, uh, I was going to say 70 kilograms, but I'm actually a little heavier now, uh, human, and I put this down like this. It's nice and sharp, and I go like that. Did you hear it? OK, well, it's not so sharp anymore, OK? Uh, actually, you can even work out how hard you have to press for a given size of point, and you get it more or less right. Uh, which indicates to me that the graphite isn't too well lined up uh, this pencil. Otherwise, it would slide along the uh, easy directions. But, but OK, anyway, um, so you get this extra factor, which is another small uh, factor. But it can only be so small. So if you take the minimal curvature to avoid material yield or breaking, then you find that you can get your rubble pile to have a minimal uh, rigidity or dimensionless rigidity, which is the dimensionless rigidity that a monolithic body would have divided by this critical yield strain. And for most multi-granular materials, critical yield strain is about 1%. If you strain something by more than 1%, it breaks. That's not true if you have perfect crystal, if you have very good ceramics. But for typical rocks, 1% is it. And so that says that you can get all the way down to here. And now you have a one-half dependence upon this uh, factor here. And uh, so we've now answered this question. If we go to uh, irregular rubbles, we can get down to this one-half power. OK. OK, so now here's some experimental results. Uh, this is very nice because this is in Ottawa sand. Uh, I couldn't find anything for Ontario sand, but this is Ottawa sand. And what's shown here, unfortunately, in English units, this is what I mean by this talk not being very well prepared, because otherwise I would have put uh, more sensible units on. This is the velocity of shear waves in a column of sand is a function of the pressure. And the velocity of shear waves goes as the square root of the effective rigidity divided by the density. So if the uh, effective rigidity scales as the one half power of the monolithic rigidity, and if you take into account the the effective rigidity has a pressure underneath it. So there's a pressure down here and one over a pressure in here in the square root. That says that the, the actual, the effective rigidity of a rubble pile goes like the actual rigidity of, this, of the material out of which it's made, in this case sand, silica, times the pressure to the one half. So this should really have a mu, I should have written mu effective, goes like mu of uh, sand times the pressure to the one-half power, well, the pressure divided by uh, 
this 1% to the 1 half power. And um, if you put in numbers for sand, uh, it fits this curve very well. And this line is a 1 quarter power of pressure that's been drawn in here to show you the data. So just taking sand, you get a very nice 1 half power fit. And this is found for many, uh, many materials. Furthermore, if you put in the uh, 3 times uh, 10 to the 11 dynes per square centimeter for the rigidity of uh, silica, you put in this 10 to the minus 2 for epsilon, uh, and you put in this pressure, you match this curve to within a factor better than 2. So you don't, you, you don't have any adjustable parameter other than the epsilon here. This is about atmospheric pressure, 14.7 pounds per square inch, if I remember from high school right. And this is per square foot, so you have to multiply by 144. Uh, this corresponds to a body of several kilometers size up here and down here to one of uh, a bit more than a kilometer in size for the central pressure. So it's the sort of range we're, we're talking about. Okay, I'm going to leave the things on steel balls, on steel, smooth steel balls uh, out. Now I want to talk about the maximum size for a rubble pile, and then I'll, I'll be almost done. Uh, so the question is, how big can a rubble pile be? Well, if you make the rubble pile too big, you crush all the contact points so that there's no room for any voids. And at that point, the formula that we had before for the rubble pile just matches that for a monolithic body. And that turns out uh, e rather easy to show. It gives a maximum radius, which is the rigidity of the constituents of the rubble pile, times this 10 to the minus 2, divided by the density squared times uh, big G. And, and for ice and rock, just because the ice is a little bit weaker, but its density is lower and the density comes in squared here, this turns out to be about 1,000 kilometers. So you don't expect to see any rubble piles bigger than 1,000 kilometers. But I told you that we only have good evidence for rubble piles up to about uh, 100 kilometer in radius. And one reason for that might be that there's also a thermal limit to how big a rubble pile can be. The cooling time for a body of a thousand kilometers is actually somewhat longer, just the heat conduction time is somewhat longer than the age of the solar system. Heat that diffuses through phonon motion, uh, phonons move uh, room temperature, a few lattice spacings at a few kilometers per second. Um, can't get out of bodies by conduction or by radiation if they're bigger than about a thousand kilometers, solid bodies. They retain heat, and if they, even if they form fairly recently in the age of the solar system, they, they accumulate enough radioactive heating so that they start to flow, and that's the end of the rubble pile. Uh, after that, of course, they can get ri rid of their heat uh, by solid state convection or even by fluid convection. Okay, so finally, uh, uh, eccentricity evolution. This one's a a little tricky. If you look at how this K, these love numbers, depend upon the size of the body, if the, if the both bodies are fluids, which is not the case here, then the tides on the secondary are more important. The K is only uh, uh, due to self-gravity then. And the eccentricity damps. The, the tides on the secondary are more important than on the primary, and they kill the eccentricity. For monoliths, if they have the same cues and they're made of the same material, because of the way K depends upon uh, size, uh, the tides on the primary win, as long as the primary is spinning fast compared to the orbit, and the eccentricity grows. And for rubble piles, if the material is exactly the same and the Q is exactly the same for the material, uh, then these two terms have the same dependence on size. Uh, there's a bigger coefficient in the upper one, I mean in the, in the lower one than in the upper one. 
So if you really believe that all that mattered was the coefficient, the eccentricity would damp. I'm not so sure that that's all there is to this. But anyway, the time scale, in order to get eccentricity damping, requires this k to be, or the k over q for these rubble piles to be at least a factor of 10,000 times uh, uh, um, bigger than it would be for a monolithic body. And that's easily explained uh, by rubble piles. So that's uh, more or less uh, my story. Um, uh, these rubble piles are there. They're tidally evolving very, very rapidly. Um, they're, uh, whether they were there from the beginning or whether they were produced because of interactions with, uh, with bigger bodies in the case, or, or due to your spin-up, uh, we're not sure. My guess is that for these small bodies, they were always uh, rubble piles from the beginning. Uh, can there be very small monolithic bodies? I think the answer is probably yes, because anything that formed very early in the solar system had a lot of short-lived radioactivity uh, present, and it would have heated up uh, even if it was only 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers in size to where it, where it became a monolith. So as long as it didn't break later, you could have small bodies that are monolithic, and maybe we'll find some. So. I guess that's about it. Thanks. Don't, don't forget there's another talk today. It's a more, more interesting subject. Uh, and I actually, I actually think a better speaker. Certainly a better squash player. Yeah. Um, are there any, uh, yeah. So are there any moons or moonlets of, of giant planets that could be rubble piles? Oh yeah, the ones I was talking about, the icy ones. Yeah, they're moons of uh, Saturn. Uh, the best example and the biggest example are the co-orbital satellites of Saturn, because they're in, they're in the same orbit. They're about well, the bigger ones about 100 kilometer in radius, and uh, and they have very obvious gravitational interactions because they move on these horseshoes. One moves one way and the other one moves. And they come close together and then they move apart and they come close together and move apart like this. And, and, and so the gravitational interactions are very easy to see. Just going into the sort of mean rotating frame and they're doing this. And they're turning around basically because of their mutual gravity. And so we have very good masses for them and we have very good images. And so we know their densities, and their densities are low, 0 0.6, 0 0.64. Um, there are two other satellites of Saturn where we have very good densities, which are a little bit smaller. Uh, so those, those, those definitely rubble piles, yeah. Now, uh, as I said, we have a couple of binary main belt asteroids and a whole bunch of near-Earth asteroids for which we have this same uh, density information. What do you think about the, uh, the triple asteroid system that Frank Marchese has found? Are those uh, useful constraints from explanation models? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, I didn't even know you had found them. So, so to uh, ask me what I think, I think it's interesting. I said that mechanically, mechanically, if, if you just take this crushing that I was demonstrating here, right, and you extend it to a logical limit for material that has yield strengths like uh, ice or rock, in both cases you find that the voids all go away at around 1,000 uh, kilometers. Now that doesn't mean that there is an object in the solar system a thousand kilometers across, which is a rubble pile, because a body that big would retain any heat that was put in it uh, for the whole age of the solar system. At least it couldn't conduct it out. So it would retain it until it either got hot enough so that it convected it out. So you said that's 50 to 1,000 kilometers. Oh, 
No, it, it, it gives actually a somewhat, it gives a slightly smaller, it's close, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's taking radioactive, well, well, there, there are two conditions. First, this says that it can't get rid of its heat uh, in the age of the solar system. The second question is how much heat is produced. Okay, now in rocks, in typical rocks, the amount of heat that's produced, like in the Earth, is enough to melt the body from radioactivity, from long lived radioactivity. So, so a body that couldn't get rid of that heat would get to where it flowed, so it could take it out convectively, uh, and so it wouldn't be a rubble pile. Uh, bodies that formed early had other radioactivities which aren't present now. They had uh, nuclides, uh, short-lived nuclides, like aluminum-26 and pluton plutonium-244 and so on. They gave much more, much higher rate of heating, but for a shorter time. And those bodies, even if they could get rid of heat in the age of the solar system, a uh, third of a Hubble time or half of a Hubble time, yeah, they, they couldn't have uh, uh, done it in several million years. And, and so they would have melted even if they were much smaller. And, and so probably many of these bodies we're talking about that are significantly bigger than these near-Earth asteroids uh, are primordial bodies in that sense. I mean, they, they were formed very early on. Almost all solids in the solar system formed very, very early on within the first few million years. And, uh, and so they would have not been rubble piles. So probably most things started off not as rubble piles. And then the rubble piles are a consequence of collision, subsequent collision. And, and then there are not many things a thousand kilometers across that got broken up. So, and if they did, they were broken up so violently that the pieces that were left, or the material that was left, was again hot enough so it fused into a coherent body. So, I don't expect you'll find a thousand kilometer sized rubble pile. It, hundred, hundred, a few hundred maybe, yeah. Yeah, so I would guess, yeah, you might have things that are uh, a couple hundred kilometers across that broke up. Yeah. Yeah? If you pass one of these rubble piles close to the planet, then you can either spin it up or spin it down. Might the tidal uh, energy dissipation be enough to bind it to the planet? Oh, that... <laughs> this, is, this is an old idea how the moon... Oh, The answer is, yes, it's possible. Uh, um, but the other part of the answer is it's very, very improbable. Because the tidal energy in it is very, very small. They'll be dissipated. It's even stored temporarily compared to the orbital energy. So it would have to be a very, very special uh, encounter. It's not a typical... Uh, uh, so it has to be a very close encounter. Yeah. Very yeah, it's, it's, no, you'd be much better off doing it with an atmosphere or colliding with something. Tides are pretty ineffective, uh, ineffective that way. Uh, by the way, there are small changes in the rotation rates of these near-Earth asteroids when they come close to the Earth. And the one that I showed you, um, the one that I showed you data from the ORP effect. Oops, where is it? There it is. I, I, I forgot to mention that the upper, uh, this one is on a horseshoe orbit with the Earth. So it comes repeatedly close to the Earth. Uh, I think you have me on that one. Uh, I knew last night, but I don't know today. <laughs> okay, but in any case, um, these points are calculations for how much the rotation rate could have been changed by tides during these close encounters. Um, so, and this is the actual data. I didn't mention this stuff. So. Okay. okay. Well, one, 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 yeah, once something breaks, right? When something gets to a certain angle of velocity and breaks, the angle of velocity depends only on the dense, I mean, the critical angle of velocity 
depends only on the density. But of course, if it breaks, the individual pieces, some of them will be spinning slower, some may be spinning faster after it breaks. Most of them will be spinning slower because they, they were close together to begin with. The, the different pieces, a small piece won't have the same uh, spin as the whole object had. Oh, yeah, 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 you can. Well, that's how, of course, the orbits expand. You can do the same thing I did here with the eccentricities, but just asking if when these things formed, they were in very tight orbits and they've tidally expanded. And what sort of K2 over Q do you need to give the tidal expansion? And assuming that these have been around only for millions of years. And again, you find you need very soft bodies and probably also smaller Q. Uh, smaller than a Q of 100. You see, at the contact points, the, the stresses are, or the strains are, are near critical, and that's what the scaling comes from. So the contact points are basically adjust to be near critical strain. And, uh, and, there, and, and we know that when you strain materials close to their critical strain, they tend to become more anelastic. They lose more energy. Something is understood about this, even the mobilization of defects and grain boundaries and so on, uh, and how that depends on strain. I couldn't find anything really good on it in the geological literature, so I, I, didn't, I didn't stress it. Oh, the near-Earth near Earth asteroids, near-Earth asteroids are a temporary population. Right, right. So Just like the people in this room. They come and they go, but they're new ones right. coming along all the time. Now, 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 the typical ones last 10 million years, rather than our, well, I hope longer than 70, but, uh, yeah, so, so the binaries, though, get dissociated quicker still from, from near encounters. So, so many of these spin up, some spin down, some spin up, and then they can change. So, so uh, because their, their rotations can change from encounters. But, yeah, so, so the spin up for these, which are kilometer sized things, they're typically on the age that they stay in, 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 in the orbit. Well, well the, it, when you work this out, you'll see that the, uh, that the rate of spin-up goes as one over the radius squared. So when you're talking about bigger objects or more distant objects from the sun, it's just much slower. It's because of the one over R squared. Yeah, so, so it's just a slower effect. This is only for little bodies. Europe is only for little bodies. Europe is much more efficient than pointing Robertson, which most of you probably have heard about. And it's sort of competitive, but a little bit different uh, from the Yarkovsky effect, which moves things in uh, semi-major axis. So if you have an, an asteroid like Icarus, for example, which comes very close to the sun, and it's very eccentric orbit, assuming that is a rubble pile, do you think that the tidal effects raised by the sun on that might actually cancel the orbit? Uh, is that theoretically impossible? It would be very unlikely if there was an exact balance. There could be a counter, you know, they, one effect could counter the other. Yeah, okay. But, so yeah, but I, yeah, yes, they, they, they could counter each other. But to, to balance even a factor of two would be just a coincidence. Yeah. 